eight thirty service, Jason. Yeah. When the weather clears up, some day. Good morning. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's uh, let's get started. Thanks everybody for coming. It's uh, appreciate this. We finally had some good weather. It's wonderful. Um, you're going to hear in prayer requests uh, today that Travis and Patty are out. Uh, Travis's friend Dave that he's prayed for and he went to visit, etc. He had the strokes and the blood clots. It sounds like he was kind of getting some country medicine before, because now he went to a real doctor. It turns out he's got terminal cancer. Aww. And that's the cause of the blood stroke, the blood clots and the strokes and all the other stuff. So I think they went to see him. So um, they, they really, it's really a, a sad situation for Travis. Um, Laura's out today. She's got in a shower at San Antonio. In fact, she's in the air right now. She'll be landing any second. We'll be back tonight. But. Um, <coughs> This morning, uh, let, let's go through some of the church-wide announcements. Let me start off with prayer requests. With Robert here, um, and the prayer requests. Uh, uh, it also has the birthday list in there if you want to take a look at that list as well. But let me go through some church-wide announcements. The one starry night is again, you know, being, uh, you know, happening again this year. Any updates, Kate, we need to know about, or do you have any more? Do you want to send the list around again, or what's I up? don't have the list, but if anybody feels led to volunteer from seven forty-five to nine o'clock, okay, at the Herbs and Spices, that's how okay. glad to take your name. Okay, way to go. Thank you. And let me, and this, I'm going to switch now here's to the Christmas party. We are we're going to do a Christmas brunch. And, and sorry about this. this, we kind of have a working brunch, you know, because the whole idea is it's, it's going to be a mission project to deliver cookies, 180 cookies. Kay's going to make 60 of these cookies. We need some volunteers to, to make some more cookies. The recipe, Kay's recipe was sent out in this week's uh, email, but uh, this will be on December the 8th in the James Gallery from 10 till noon. Uh, Diana, can we still give, give 30 or 40 to our children's house uh, staff? Uh, I don't think they turned down. Okay, so uh, we're going to give at least 60 or, or, or 90 to Austin Street uh, you know, Shelter. Uh, and we may have some other ones. Carolyn, do we have any uh, any Buckner type things to this year or no? I can find out. Okay, find out. <laughs> and, uh, now the, let, me, let me tell you, the uh, the cost is going to be around 12 bucks per person but for the church to, to do this. Uh, if you want to bring someone with you, let us know. I'll send an invite out because we need to know the head count. That's how much the church is going to charge us, whether they show up or not. So uh, anyway, that's how the kind of thing it works because they're going to prepare for all that. They have people that work for that. But it's a it's a fun time. We'll make some cookies. Um, Diana, we, we need some help from you. you. You got those things we wrapped them in last time, which were really if you can help us with some of that and the little tie. What we did is tie them off individually, put a little uh, put a little verse on there, Merry Christmas from Foundations of Faith, and had a, had a scripture on it, and then we would give them out, and we'd load them up, and the, 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 the process here is, Kay's got some fast drying icing, that's what saved us last year, and that icing would dry by the time we finished eating, so then we're ready to go back and wrap them and pack them, and uh, we're out of there by noon, so that's how it worked, and then Laura and I delivered them to, uh, to some of the other places, Carolyn delivered to Butner, I think I, you delivered them to, um, to our children's house, so... That'll work. If you can make that, put that date on there, and uh, I'll send an evite out so we can get a head count uh, on that. And that's the other question. I found out this week they would love for us to decorate for Christmas okay. again this year. All right. And the, we don't have to wait on the inspectors this year because that's over. Okay. So, so we, what's the date on that? So typically we've done it the mm -hmm. Sunday after Thanksgiving. Okay. What, anybody have a calendar? Oh, oh. That'd be the 25th. Okay. Yeah. So November the 25th, we're going to do Christmas tree decoration. After what? After church. So that's the day I think that everybody's having missions meetings. So oh, really? I know that Heather's having her missions okay. meetings. Yeah, she changed. She had to change it because of the, <coughs> something about the sanctuary choir and rehearsing. Oh, my goodness. Well, we're going to figure that out. Yeah. We, we need about probably about 10 of us if we can. To help set, set these trees up, it's a fun it's time, Saturday. and uh, the children love it. And it's a, uh, you know, let's uh, kind of plan on that one if you can. See if you can. So it's the 25th. Yeah, it's whatever that Sunday is after, after Thanksgiving. So uh, let's do that. Did we get with you about the cookies? I don't know who's in charge. Let's uh, well just just we just need to know how many we need 180 cookies. Okay, Kay's gonna make five dozen. That's 60. Okay, Kay's already got a third of them done. So, I need a recipe. The recipe, <laughs> our recipe was mailed to you uh, in your in your Sunday school email this week. 
Oh, okay. It's legal. I scanned it. I scanned it, and uh, it was in okay. there. I got. Perfect. In fact, I had a couple of spots. Of, it rained on me on the way in the office on Monday, and I got the little the, when I scanned it. It kind of, it's kind of had a couple of you know, little dots on it. You know, it can okay. usually eat lunch first, and so it's we don't really start. Okay. So as so long as I know where you are. One o'clock or one thirty. Yeah, yeah. We'll have yeah, because I get out of mission me by one thirty. Okay. Oh, you've been. Yeah. We're still having time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. 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 Terry, let me tell you, Terry's the third one who saved our biscuits <laughs> when, when we had a, whole, a cancellation seven days before the first lesson, the first three weeks of October, and Terry saved us. So uh, well, uh, we appreciate that, Terry. Well, you know how much I enjoy coming. So anyway, um, as usual, I'm indebted to others for today's information. Henry was kind enough to share information he used in a lesson on Nicodemus. And another source is a book called Reading John for Dear Life by Jamie Clark Souls. She's a professor at Perkins Theological Seminary at SMU. And I used the 1970 Rodman uh, commentary along with some other sources. So please jump in when you have a comment or a question, okay? Uh, the, the note that you got in your email is that this lesson is supposed to deal with uh, the beginnings of Jesus' ministry, the start of his ministry. And it is very different in John than it is in the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They were given that designation of synoptic sometime around 1780, I think was the date. And these books, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're very similar in what they record. Uh, and even though sometimes things are not on the exact same timeline, they generally, it's called seeing together. That's what synoptic means. They saw this together. Uh, John, on the other hand, uh, if you look at charts that show overlapping uh, events, uh, you will find that John has very few of what Matthew, Mark, and Luke have. Uh, and his timeline differs considerably. Um, for, uh, for instance, in John, Jeru uh, Jesus gets to Jerusalem just very quickly. Uh, whereas in the, the other Gospels, it's quite a while before he gets into Jerusalem. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke tend to have Jesus operating mostly uh, in the Cana, Cap Capernaum uh, area, although he travels around, but a lot of what he does in those Gospels is, is in that area. Whereas John has him more in Jerusalem or south of Jerusalem and working in that area. Uh, so uh, it's, it's almost, those three are are rural and John is urban. Okay, <laughs> not purely, but it it almost seems that way sometimes. But here's the deal: John, as you already know, is far more theological. Uh, more than one scholar indicates that the purpose of this gospel is to establish a theology around the nature of Jesus the Christ by trying to explain the presence of both divine and human qualities in Jesus. Uh, in the other Gospels, they use the word miracles, and they have several of them. In John, he never uses the word miracle. Anything that he does that we see as out at, like this, John says is a sign uh, that that is to point to God, and particularly the God aspect in the human Jesus. Uh, according to Broadman, there are only seven signs used in John, because seven is the number symbolizing completion. Uh, now there is one source that listed the last miracle catching all those fish as uh, but John does not treat that as a miracle. Uh, I guess he just, he treats it like they caught all those fish, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but anyway, so we have to look at John in terms 
of the writer is building a Christology. Jesus is the Word and the Lamb of God from the very beginning of this Gospel. We have no Bethlehem story here. Uh, so, perhaps uh, more than any other, this, uh, the literary elements he uses points to this theological interpretation. And he loves using repetition of words, images, symbols. He uses the word life 36 times in this gospel. Uh, and you have the light and darkness uh, imagery used frequently. In fact, it will be used today. Uh, but one of the things that probably really uh, is, uh, is typical of John uh, is the way that the, <coughs> the encounters that he has with people individuals is very intimate. He's, he's very focused on the individual. He's not preaching, you know, he's not talking to the individual as if they are uh, part of a larger group. He doesn't have a, me a, a message that is one size fits all, I guess is the way to say it. He speaks to the person where they are. And it becomes a very... Uh, intimate uh, encounter. And John, the Gospel of John really writes uh, the writer to show that those who encounter the grace of Jesus as the Son of God will live transformed lives. So this as a result of the encounter with Jesus. So that's kind of the background for what we're going to talk about today. Now, the chapters you have, two through four, uh, the, the, whoever set up the lesson says, basically, you can't do all of this, <laughs> so pick something and, and do it. And um, these chapters represent the early part of Jesus' ministry, which was pretty successful. It's not going to be until chapter 5 that things kind of began to go off the rails, we might say. Um, that the passages today sort of begin and end in that rural area up toward Cana and Capernaum. He's going to go in this passage to Jerusalem. And then he's going to work his way back, and he's going to go through Samaria and meet the Samaritan woman But uh, as he travels back. Uh, there are four events today, changing the water to wine, the cleansing of the temple, the encounter with Nicodemus, and the encounter with the Samaritan woman. And obviously, we can't do it all. So I thought I would take a public event, the wedding, and a private event, Nicodemus, uh, and then we will save the Samaritan woman. I will be back on November the 25th uh, and do that. And if we have a chance to uh, look at how he deals with the religious authorities, both today and, and on the 25th. So uh, let's revisit the wedding in Cana. When you think about the wedding in Cana and changing the water to wine, what, what were the messages you got when you heard this talk or preached throughout the years? What's the thing you remember most about it? Now, the comment that they said they saved the best for last. So that, okay, that always stuck in my mind. The best for last. I hate to admit this, but you know, every time I hear this story, what I remember is preachers and teachers insisting that it wasn't really blind. No. <laughs> yeah, I'm not the only one that heard that. There, there's a wonderful scene in the movie uh, Bernie uh -huh. uh, with Jack Black, and he, he plays this East Texas yeah. uh, mortician that mm -hmm. ended up uh, murdering someone. If y'all have Texas... not seen the movie, it's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, but uh, it really it captures the flavor of East Texas very well, and there's this great Sunday school scene where Shirley, the character Shirley McLean plays, goes to Sunday school after having been 
absent for a long time. And this is the passage that they talk about. And they just sit around debating about whether it was non-alcoholic wine. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, basically people can read the story and they get so wrapped up in things like that that they miss the, yeah, they, miss the whole story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So more, more recently, Paul Skelton posted a picture on Facebook in, from the grocery store and there was a sign that said water, but there were, it was like, all the yeah. wine section. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, and he says Jesus must have been here. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so, you know, and, and this is really the event that starts with John, his public ministry. Uh, so let's take a look at this uh, on John 2, and we'll just begin reading some of this and see what he has, has to say. Obviously, a wedding is a very joyous occasion, uh, at least most are. Um, and, and they have traveled. So if somebody would read uh, John 2, um, verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. Okay. Um, first off, what would your mother do if you turned around and said, Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> that would have set his ministry back about two years. That's <laughs> right. That would have set his ministry back about two years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and my life back. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, now, you know, here she is, they're running out of wine, and, and Mary is obviously noticing what seems to be the implication here when she turns around and says to him, do something. Perform a miracle. Perform a miracle. Uh, produce more wine. Produce more wine. Uh, you know, the implication seems to be that she knows that he's capable of doing these things. <coughs> Uh, but his response is, uh, you know, what do you, have, woman, what do you have to do with me? What seems to be happening here in this verse uh, in terms of the way he speaks to her? What do you have to do with me? It almost sounds like he's redefining their relationship. Mm -hmm. He's been the good son, you know, and but he's re, she, she's going to have to give him up if he starts his ministry. If he starts doing these things in a public way, then you know it, it's going to change things. This is the first public. This is the first sign in John. Now, we're going to have a little timeline issue later on with Nicodemus, okay? But, but for John, this is the first sign. And he's not going to call it a miracle. And he may not be, have been, really been ready to go public. Yeah, well, and that's what he says. My hour has not come. It makes me wonder, he obviously knew when his hour was. I mean, that's what it implies. And I'm, and I'm sitting here going, well, I wonder when that hour... Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I think one of the things, at least one of the commentary talks about whatever he did had to fit his mission. Um, uh, now, on the other hand, we're going to read 5 through 10. And um, Mary, Mary says to him, Go ahead and do whatever he tells you to do. Now, he has just said this to her. My hour has not come. And she turns around and says, just do whatever he tells you to do. You know, we've all had mothers like that. You know. Um, but we're going to see... Uh, I got the impression when I read it, uh, Terry, that, you know, he just, I mean, turning water into wine for a bunch of drugs just wasn't high enough on the priority. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. Do you have, yeah, and we could look at it that way for I mean, sure. Yeah, it's not like healing the blind. Or but, you know, but, this is a very joyous occasion. Yeah. This is a wedding. This is new beginnings. See, when you ask why John might have 
set this here. Weddings are, are examples of new beginnings. Mm -hmm. And he is about to start something that is truly a new beginning mm -hmm. in the way people are going to relate to God. Uh, so um, Relate to Jesus. Well, and to God. Oh, yeah, okay. Both to Jesus, but to God. Definitely they're going to change the way they relate right. to Him. Right. But it's also going to lead to the greater mission for how they're going to change and have a new beginning in, the, in their relationship with God. Uh, so let's look at 5 through 10. <coughs> Someone? His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the wine knew. Draw the water. Who had drawn the water knew, thank you. Uh, the steward called the bridegroom uh, and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Okay. Um, you know, Jesus goes ahead and does this. Even though he's indicated he doesn't want to do it. And the Broadman commentary says this is not the first time this happens, where Jesus seems very reluctant to do something, but goes ahead and does it. And he, the commentary suggested there are three reasons uh, one, that he didn't want to do it. Uh, he didn't want to be guided by human pressure. He, didn't, he wanted to, what he did to relate to the will of God. And he wanted to deal with issues at a deeper level than people tended to want to think, even his own disciples. Uh, and I have to say this just as an aside, but <coughs> that's the problem with Jesus. He's always asking questions that push us to think more deeply, clearly, and ethically, and to put things in a redemptive context. In other words, he wants us to think about how we let him save us, <laughs> in a sense. But he goes ahead and does this. Now, uh, the six stones are part of the, pur the ceremonial pur purification washings by Jews. When they come in, they would stick their arms all the way down to the elbows. Now, you can imagine what's going to happen. They've just filled the, these <laughs> jars up with water to the brim. What's going to happen if you put your hands in there? It's going to wash over. Uh, uh, and they didn't apparently throw away the dirty water that was already there. Uh, and remember, these people come out of a very dusty West Texas environment. You know, they're dusty. Uh, West, uh, like West Texas squared, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you may be right about that. Yes. Um, but the commentary says, and you know, when you read this, where do you think they got the water? Out of the jugs? But according to the commentary, when it says they, he sent the servants to draw out the water, mm -hmm. that that means they went out to the well, well and got water. Mm -hmm. They didn't take the water out of those jugs. Uh, so, uh, symbolically, the six stone jars represent the old Jewish ceremonial system. And the fresh well becomes the seventh source of water. Uh, and we already know that means completeness. Uh, and he seems to be, you know, teaching his disciples in particular who were sometimes confused about what he was doing. Uh, uh, about his power to transform not only the wine, but lives. Uh, the old way is com incomplete, uh, is what this wedding sign is all about, uh, with the six stones. And Jesus is bringing to this feast of new beginnings uh, a new and transformative beginning. 
the symbol, wine is a symbol of joy. Uh, combined with, they dug those wells deep. You have an abundance of water out of those wells because they went deep and tapped underground sources of water. Uh, so you, you have this, the well being uh, so much a part of this. You know, so why did Jesus go ahead and do this? Let's look at verse 11. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. When you hear, when you think back about the wedding and what's going on here, is that what you remember about it? That he did this and his disciples believed in him. But according to the writer, that's why it was done. Jesus is really doing it for the benefit of his disciples. Yes, he's helping out the party, but he's really doing something so that his disciples can feel a sense of assuredness that he is who they think he is, or they hope he is. Uh, this was so, apparently a small number of people. I mean, you, you don't hear that the whole wedding party, you know, knew about it. It's no. just a very small number of people even knew. So maybe Canada did accomplish some of it. He didn't. He wasn't ready to go public fully with that. But you know, this was kind of an inside reveal. Yeah. Of, uh, of his. All of his. the all the people at the party knew was the host saved the best wine until last. Right. You know. Uh, so the disciples really tend to be the focus here of what's going on, which speaks to us as disciples. Uh, uh, and, you know, and the thing about it is this happens at a party. Did any of you go to Matt Dogdrill, Dogdrill's uh, Wednesday night things on accidental theology? Uh, I'm sorry, I couldn't make it. And I'm not sure what he meant by that, but I'm thinking that he was talking about making connections with God in non-religious situations like the wedding. Uh, I don't know. I, I feel like often I'm finding Jesus in all the wrong places. Mm -hmm. Do any of you do that? You're watching a movie and suddenly it's like, oh, Christ figure. <laughs> Sacrificing, serving. And anybody do that? But songs. I don't have time to break down the, the Genesis uh, imagery in Margaritaville. You know? <laughs> yeah. uh, but it's there. You and Lynn Morris. <laughs> yeah. So it's possible like, according to your playlist. Yeah. 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 So, uh, and I've got some lessons on finding Jesus in all the wrong places. Mm. You know, but, you know, can, can you think of a time when you were in a totally non religious setting? Then it went, oh goodness, there's Jesus, there's the Christ imagery, there's the servant imagery, or the sacrificial imagery that we see. So uh, I think what we have here in this wedding is that we have to be open uh, to seeing What's, some, what's going on sometimes in our non-religious settings that, that we have. And, and hopefully we have a leap forward. Now, I've given you a moment to think. Can anyone, has anyone come up with a leap forward moment? Oh, oh, oh I had a question, but okay. not, not a leap, but I'll reserve my question. Oh, that's okay. Someone else wants to share a leap forward moment. Okay. I think a lot of things, I mean, nobody comes up to you at work and say, I was reading John 3.16 last night and I didn't get it. I mean, the, the questions are more like that we got at work for like when the Ebola crisis hit. They were amazed at what Wilshire did during that time. And that, you know, and the thing that George sent out this week, I guess, you know, that, that both and John, his, Mark did a little five minute snippet, you know, of the both and John part of the sermon, it was, it, that's gotten to 267,000 hits or whatever. Somebody took that, cut it down to one minute, sent it out by Twitter, someone in New York mm -hmm. that doesn't even know Wilshire, and two million people saw that. Mm -hmm. And it's just amazing. Yeah, yeah. 
And that's what can happen uh, when we grasp that Christ imagery. Anyone else? What did you want to So, ask? well, my question was, uh, I find it interesting that what you, you're, I assume the sources that you studied were saying that the source of the water that turned into wine was the well, well and not water. the jars. Uh -huh. Which I've never heard it interpreted that way. I've, I've heard it interpreted that the water was drawn from the jars and the meaning was is that Jesus was taking the old ways mm -hmm. and making something new out of them. The, the, the jars represent Jewish uh, tradition and culture and the Torah and the uh -huh. law and that Jesus then uses that and makes some new creation out of it. Yeah. But it sounds like what well, you see, I, that's what I had always kind of gathered. It reads like... Well, it does it just say, it, of, it, it says, now draw some out. Yeah, and it sounds like I always thought he did the jars. But the Broadman says that draw out, as it is used in John, means to get water out of the well. So another source, or a deeper source, or a... Yeah, Okay. A, yeah, and it also fulfills that seven symbolism. Oh. See, you've got six, the six jars. jars and the well, the fresh water. Oh. That is that the six jars are the old ways, and now you have the fresh water that is the new one, the, that is used for wine. I think either one is legitimate because it gets down both get to the point that Jesus is bringing something new, something new into yeah. the equation. And that, that <coughs> ceremony and purification and all of those things that even we engage in from our religious background. I know some of you did not go to movies on Saturday, Sunday, you know, and you didn't dance for sure. And the fact that we are even talking about wine in a Baptist church, <laughs> let alone those of us who drink it. I never saw the end of the Wizard of Oz till my kids were, were born. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you understand why you can get both, but the idea here is something new is going on. Grace, uh, Jesus and his mission of grace can change how we make commitments. And what the disciples see may deepen their commitment to Jesus. You know, but there is still... that, uh, when I read this scripture and uh, how Jesus turned a very ordinary water into wine, this is how God is practice yeah. over the years. He doesn't really have to go, go, go bless your life with a great big miracle. Instead, start off with very simple, very insignificant in your life. Sometimes you look at your own life. You can see lots of times that people come to your life, give you a lift, a miracle happens. It's a very ordinary people, not big religious figure, not powerful in federal government, rather a very simple person. Yeah. And, it, and it points us. The point the to you yeah. that's how Jesus, the God, is doing those kinds of things for his, for his own children. Like you see, I don't know how many of you, you can look back your own life. Some people have become part of your lift in your life. It's very, not a big, not famous people, not just a very educated people, maybe it's become very ordinary people. Absolutely. Oh, that is. Yeah. And I think that's what part of what this is getting to is that we have a tendency to want big signs instead of small signs and that and but it can be the smallest of things that can move us forward in our understanding uh, of the kind of relationship Jesus 
would have with us and, and a relationship that comes out of grace which can change us and that we can offer to others. Um, now, um, though we're all buried in our culture, one way or the other, in our religious conditioning, which leads us to Nicodemus, okay? Now, Henry, you, you can't be a show-off and tell us how you know about Nicodemus. No, I was, okay. <laughs> what do you know about Nicodemus? He was a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee. His own Jewish Roman council. On the Part of the Roman council. Yeah, the Sanhedrin. A group of 70. They were in charge of sort of the legalism's uh, leadership uh, of the Jewish people. He wanted to get to know Jesus, but he didn't want to do it in the daylight. He yeah, he didn't want anybody to know about it. And let's talk about that. Yeah. Uh, the, the thing about it is... Um, he uh, he was a trained theologian, because most Pharisees were. And since he was the, this group of 70 uh, that was really in charge of sort of the religious life and legal life of Jews, you know how the Romans were, y'all take care of your business mm -hmm. and don't cause us any trouble and we'll leave you alone. <coughs> Just pay your taxes. Pay taxes yeah. yeah, and so, but... Um, you know, so obviously he's he's an extremely well-educated person, a very thoughtful person. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the word Pharisee has taken on a negative meaning. But the interesting thing is the Pharisees were the clergy closest to the people. They were the most democratic in the sense that they wanted all of the Jewish people to be able to study the Torah in their homes and in the synagogues. They were not, you might say, elitist like the, the Sadducees were in the temple. They, the Sadducees, as I mentioned the last time, handled the temple. So the Pharisees, really, they had a lot of things positive. And it almost seems like Jesus was really tough on them. Uh, because they were close, well, we don't know why he was tough, but it seems like he, they are the ones he calls out when he gets on them, and we'll talk about that on the 25th. Um, well, he, he, Nicodemus at least saw that confrontations with Jesus just led to antagonism, and so he, I guess he truly wanted to learn more about what Jesus was about, so that's why he chose night. Yeah, well, it, it, uh, it's interesting that let's let's take a look at uh, verses. Um, well, let, let me just say this first. So, uh, uh, in in this passage, Jesus is going to say in in this translation in the NSV. I think it says very truly. There will be in in uh, the uh, Revised Standard Version. It says. Truly, truly, in the in the NIV, he he says, uh, "I tell you the truth." And then in the King James, anyone remember the King James? Verily, verily, I say unto you. <laughs> yeah. So, but these are like big amens before he says something. Okay. Uh, before he gets into what he was saying. So it, it, these words are used 25 times in this gospel where he says, truly, truly, or verily, verily, or I tell you the truth. <coughs> so they precede something really important. They're like the Old Testament, thus saith the Lord. Okay? That's the equivalent. Uh, uh, you know, we tend to say amen after something. This is the big amens before, okay? Uh, also, you'll see the flesh and spirit motif, and you'll see the light and dark motifs. There are three exchanges between Jesus and Nicodemus. So let's look at verses 1 through 3. Would someone read? Well, there's a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night. And said to him, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. No one can do the signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Jesus 
answered him, Very <coughs> truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Okay. Uh, you asked why he came at dark. Interestingly enough, the, the um, you know, the, I think Jesus has just cleaned out the temple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you might not want to be seen with this guy. <laughs> uh, the other hand, on the other hand, uh, according to uh, the commentary, uh, Jewish th theologians oftentimes met at night to discuss things. Uh, that was a good time to study at night. So, um, and then of course symbolically, he is making a move coming out of spiritual dark into spiritual light. Does that make sense? If he's coming to Jesus, there must be something that he's feeling, that he's wanting to know. Uh, to understand uh, about this man. Terry, this Bible uh, says that one reason, another reason he might have gone at night, he wanted to have a long conversation with yeah. Jesus, and that would be nearly impossible during the day. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that would be typical of the Jewish. And in their exchanges, you have to bear in mind that the Jewish tradition of Bible study was to ask questions back and forth, to not so much challenge or, uh, uh, but to to forward the conversation, you might say. Uh, and of course, uh, we in here I said there's a little timeline thing because he says something about. Uh, I'm sorry, how did it go? Um, no one can do these signs that you do apart from the presence of God. Well, we've only had one sign here, right? So the implication is Nicodemus knows some stuff about Jesus that John has not talked about. The implication seems to be, you know, that there might have been some signs, so we don't know. It, it's just one of those things that we're not exactly where he's coming from, except that he knows Jesus is in touch with God and that he wants to talk to him. So let's, uh, Jesus says, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. And then we'll look at four through six. Would someone read that? How can someone be born when they are old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb before. <coughs> Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh. The Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. The wind blows whatever it pleases. Okay, you want to stop right, Sorry. right there? That's okay, no. Um, you know, um, When you, when you see that, uh, that you have to be born again, and, and Nicodemus, again, is not being obtuse here. He's not being dumb. He, he is asking the question that is, requires Jesus to give a theological answer, in essence. Uh, so he does this comparison of birth, flesh of flesh, and spirit of spirit. Um, as you look at that, um, and he talks about the spirit, um, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have started. We probably should have gone through eight. Okay, and I'm sorry I stopped you. You mean read it? Go ahead, yes. Read so that. starting at 7. Yeah. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows what, uh, wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Okay. Now, how do you feel about this idea of the Spirit being something we can, like the wind, being something we sense but we can't see? I mean, we like to see things, right? 
Well, with the wind, no. you see the effects of the wind, but you don't see the wind. Yeah. And when you think about seeing the effects of the spirit, how does that translate? And, and, you know, Dennis was talking about what Wilshire has done has now exploded into this, in a way, the internet is now our wind. <laughs> right. It almost seems. But you see, so what's your reaction to that? How, do you trust your senses? Yes. Pretty much, yeah. yeah. I think it's it, it becomes more challenging. He earlier talked about finding Jesus in all the wrong places. Uh -huh. So if you're in one of those wrong places and you sense something or you see something that reminds you or makes you think I'm witnessing the power of the Spirit or I'm witnessing the risen Christ working through this, if you're not in a religiously safe place it by religiously say I mean if you're not in a religious context you you have to wonder okay am, is, is this what I'm sensing or do I just think that I'm, I'm sensing that mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm making sense yeah, as, I'm, as I'm describing it but but it, it and so I, I think this passage about the wind is talking about this this experience of of having to to be more perceptive in those times when you think you are noticing the presence and the action of God, but you're not in one of those situations where it's already been approved by the, the religious establishment. Yeah. Anyone else? I think it's easier to see the effects of the Holy Spirit in other people than to discern within myself if it's the spirit or if it's, you know, like, is this from God or is this just me? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you know, then is then we go back to if Jesus is the standard, does it fit with Jesus? And I think maybe... I, I don't know. I'm just tossing that out because when we start doubting ourselves, where do we go for, uh, where, where do we go to try to make uh, an evaluation? Then, and it's not always easy, it's not always easy to remember, okay, how does this play in the context of what, Je how Jesus lived? and what he taught. Carolyn? We're comparing two different things in my mind. We're comparing something that's very real and concrete, such as birth, mm -hmm. with that which is we can't see. Mm -hmm. and, and that we have to rely on our senses mm -hmm. to do that. And, uh, but yet, Jesus is making a very real example of the wind. We can feel it. We can know it. It exists. Mm -hmm. So it's not that far away from us mm -hmm. <laughs> in trying to understand the spiritual birth. Yeah. But it is up to God. Yeah. It is not up to us. Well, and well, to the degree that we have to be willing to accept the grace that God is offering us, you know, and how we respond to that. Uh, I mean, it's there, but we have we have to respond. And, 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 or am I misunderstanding what you're saying? No, we we do, we do. I, that's the only thing we have to do. Basically, we can't we can't make it happen. Yeah, it requires we, action on our part. Though. Yeah. It requires yeah. us to re a response on our part. The support. wind comes, mm -hmm. but what causes the wind? What brings it on? We don't. <laughs> so yeah. verse eight's kind of like a parable, but it's not a parable. He's using it as a means of conveyance. It, that, that there's two worlds. Yeah, using the, using the wind as an example to explain the spirit. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah. Kind of like a parable, but it's not a parable. Well, it, I think we call it a metaphor. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. So, uh, I guess I'm asking the that question, how do we know we're saved? How do we know if we cannot see? Faith. Right. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. Where this that's, that, that little word faith comes yeah. in. That's, yeah. I mean, but that's know. where what that but that's what we see with the disciples <clears throat> is their faith growing at the wedding when they see what he does. That you know, and and you know, I think what Robert is saying is that in terms of Nicodemus He's got all of the religious knowledge. And he may even have the spirit, but he's like, he's like a lot of us. We have to step back from all of that that we have and let our senses respond. That, uh, what was it Lincoln that said, our better angels, there are times when they speak and, and we sense that there is something better that we can do or, or a, a different way of thinking. So uh, the, John really is trying to move our understanding of spirit forward, of, of being able to sense things rather than having things, in, if you will, all written down, <laughs> you might say. So we then get to uh, the third exchange, 9 through 15, if somebody would read that. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and testified of what we have seen. Yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must, must, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Okay. Uh, obviously, this is heavy-duty theology that Jesus, and it's going to continue. Uh, uh, the, the descending from heaven and the ascending imagery. Uh, but how do we identify with Nicodemus? Well, we have him three times in this book, and he only appears in John. He appears here, a seeker, uh, someone who knows something's going on inside of him. Then in chapter 7, we have him again where the, the Sanhedrin is discussing what they should do about Jesus, and he's, he tries to say, well, Jesus is due, due process. We have to follow, and he sort of gets batted down, and he shuts up very quickly. You know how it is when you try to say something mm -hmm. and the power's... They, you know, he backs off. And I think we've all done that. We, we know something is missing, and we reach out for it, but then sometimes in reaching out and in trying to discuss and trying to stand for what we believe, I still remember the time <coughs> when a racial slur, and I knew I should say something, and I didn't. You know, I shrunk back so I can identify with Nicodemus. Uh, and then he appears the third time, again, three times we get Nicodemus. The seeker, the shrinker, and then he, he is with Joseph of Arimathea, who dares to ask for the body of Christ to be buried, so he could bury it. And Nicodemus is with Joseph of Arimathea and helps to prepare the body for burial. So we see here with Nicodemus, we don't, we don't have all of the answers, but we certainly see that he wants, there's something driving him to be in relationship and that his encounter with Jesus changed him uh, and moved him forward. Uh, uh, so uh, the, he's going to disappear. 
uh, and I need to disappear about this moment too. Uh, <laughs> but the rest of this chapter, I don't know how many of you have ever associated Nicodemus with John 3.16? Not me, but that's what's coming in this chapter. Now, he just kind of disappears, but we, you almost have to make the assumption that Jesus is still talking to Nicodemus here. He's not talking to an empty room, you know. And he goes through, and uh, just very quickly, John 3, 17. Anybody can quote that? <laughs> okay. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. He did not send judgment. He sent grace. And these chapters, 2 through 4, are reinforcing 17, uh, that verse 17, that, that Jesus came to offer grace and not judgment. And then it's up to us. So, uh, and in verse 21, but those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Uh, recently I heard someone say, and I will say, amen, amen. If you want to worship God, serve people. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. Okay. We've got uh, a few prayer requests here, and I want to add one here to uh, talk about later on when you'll be praying for the three in our class that you, as you guys travel to uh, Israel, Diana and Ken and Tracy. Hope you guys have a safe trip. And when will you be back? When will you guys be back in them? Are you back earlier? Or? <coughs> Tracy and I come back on the 9th. The 9th. Or, sorry, the 8th. Yeah, I come back on the 11th. Okay. And I may be here next week. Ken's leaving Friday, yeah, I'm right? I'm leaving Friday. Okay, okay. All right, we'll pray for the group there. Also, as I said in the opening, that Travis Keith friend Dave is the one they found out has terminal cancer. And I don't even know, is it palliative care? Mm -hmm. short is it's that hospice. The hospice, okay. All right, thank you, thank you. All right. Uh, and that's the reason he was having those strokes mm -hmm. because of that. And then Robert and Bonnie, as they travel, they should be back through with us um, either the last Sunday of October, more likely the first Sunday of November, as they come back. And anything else, any other prayer requests that we need to add to the list? Je pray for Jacob. Jacob, yes. Jacob, is he preaching today? Next Sunday. today. It's next Sunday, though, isn't it? No, it's, it's today. today. Yeah, it's yeah they went, they've been up there this week. Oh, but it is this week. I thought it was the 28th. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, let's pray then. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and the time to put the business of the world aside and study your word, to read scripture together and to ask questions and to try to understand more 